keeping, creeping certain behaviors, keeping certain behaviors secret, especially behaviors that are seen and understood to be wrong, means continual struggle with yourself. The internal dissonance and lack of sense of personal integrity is draining. The struggle involved in keeping a secret is stressful. This means your brain will register the fact that there are increased levels of stress hormones going through your bloodstream as a result of this struggle to keep your secret. Your brain does not enjoy this stress. Those living double lives with the stress of keeping the whole section of their lives secret from the people they see every day and care about suffer. This guy is not a Christian at all. The fact that their brains are marinated in stress hormones due to keeping the secret over and above the effects of the wrongdoing themselves can cause an impairment in the person's ability to stay healthy and function well. Matt Chandler says that this is science catching up to the Bible. James Pinbaker, uh, another, uh, James Pinbaker, also looking at this research, he found that whether the secrets were confessed to another person out loud or merely just written down in private or a shared letter, there were tangible health benefits, both physical and <clears throat> mental. You see, this is science catching up to the Bible, but we've known this for a while. A believer must be marked by a life of confession. You have to ask yourself, you know, what sin are you holding on to? What sin are you still working on? What sin have you not confessed, and you, and you have not confessed it because you know it can destroy the lives? Maybe you've hurt some people, maybe you've done something, if this comes out, your reputation and everything is going to be tarnished, it's going to be over. But you've got to understand that sin not confessed can only lead into more sin. How many guys have been working on not watching pornographic material for like all of their life? It's insanity to think that one day you're just going to wake up and just stop doing it. As evangelicals, we don't like confession because the Catholic Church takes it way too far. But confession is a way of life for a believer. We are keeping it real with God and ourselves and speaking to people who really care about us so they can pray for us. There may be sin in your life that if people find out, it could embarrass you. But having that burden off of you and walking in fellowship with God is so much better. Don't live in fear that someone's going to find out. Confess your sins. And I was told a long time ago by, by a guy that most people already know what's going on. They already know what you're doing. Confess it. God desires for you to confess it. We ought to be praying in faith and singing and calling our elders for support. We ought to be confessing our sins whenever we find ourselves suffering or hurting or in trials. And I love how James ends it, this, this passage, he said in verse 17, he says, we need to do all of that because we are like Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, is what it says, a nature like ours. So I studied, went back to uh, Kings and looking at Elijah's life, and you know, Elijah is a prophet of God, and he, he, he prays for you know, he does this, comes on the scene just doing miraculous things, just really miraculous things. Out of nowhere, just boom, he just pops up. No introduction, no nothing, just boom, I'm here, ready to call fire down from heaven. Just, just awesome things that we all wish that we could do. I mean, he prays for a drought because God's people were living in disobedience and it doesn't rain for three years and six months. He goes to the widow of Jarephet, and who she lives only with her son. She has no food. She's preparing to die. All she has is flour and oil in a jar. He tells her, look, uh, bring it to me. Bring, make the last, the last batch. Bring it to me. He prays over it and continues. He says for many days, they continue to have bread. They continue to be fed. But then her son gets sick, and he dies. And Elijah raises him from the dead. Then Elijah has a standoff with the people of Baal, 450 verses 1 on Mark Carmel, to see whose God is really real. He calls down fire, and then he has all the prophets killed by the people. A man like this, in my eyes, is close to God. Will we agree? He is close to God. 
Yet, he runs afraid of Jezebel. Jezebel was mad that, she, that Elijah killed all his prophets, her prophets, and he runs and hides from her. He asked the Lord to kill him. He says, take my life. He wants to die. He goes and hides in the mountain, in, in Horeb, the mountain of God, and God says to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And, uh, and Elijah says, I've been very zealous for you, Lord. And I'm the only God worshiper left. And God says, no, you're not. I have 7,000 people in Israel who have not bowed to Baal. God says to us, when we're in our situations, what are you doing? Why aren't you communing with me? Why aren't you trusting me? Why aren't you walking with me? Because the same thing he said to Elijah, Elijah he says to us, we have that same nature just like him. And I was thinking about this, that Elijah, he turned the hearts of people back to God for a short period of time. But God used them in that short period of time. And Elijah prayed before the fire came down. You see, many believers have strayed from the truth. And we see in verse 9, it talks about bringing people back from the truth. There's things that God has that he wants us to do. There are things that he would like for us to be doing, reflecting his glory, winning people back who have turned from the Lord, uh, trusting in him, obedience, the church, gathering, our community, and all these things. But if we're not trusting in the Lord, communing with him, we're not going to do any of those things. The secret to Elijah's power was that he walked in the will of God. The drought that we like to talk about, that, that drought that he prayed three years and six months it wasn't just his idea. God had already said, I'm going to bring a drought on the people of Israel if they do not obey me. Elijah's prayers were prayers in the will of God. You, am I making sense? He was so closely walking with God that his desires were changed. His, he could have prayed for a lot of things. He could have prayed for a lot of things, but he prayed for what God desired. That can only come from prayer. It can only come from prayer. As James always does, if you look at all his, if you lay out the book of James and you and you look at all his teachings, all of his teachings go back, they find their perfection in Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ, he taught, he taught his disciples to pray. He healed people with prayers. He denounced the corruption of the temple worship, which he said, my house should be a house of prayer. He insisted that some demons could be cast out only through prayer. He prayed often and regularly with fervent cries and, and tears while he's praying. And sometimes all night, the Holy Spirit came upon him and, he and anointed him as he was praying. And he was transfigured with divine glory as he prayed. When he faced his greatest crisis, he did so with prayer. Going back to how we started in Matthew 26, the prayers of Jesus were not answered. He asked the Lord to take the cup of suffering away from him. The cross was the cup he had to drink. And it was human not to want to bear that, the suffering that he was about to go up against. But Jesus said, not my will, Father, but your will. And because of that, he paid for our neglect to pray. To pray. He, he, prayed, he paid the sins of our reckless prayer life, our disobedient prayer life, our sinful prayer life, by having a holy prayer life, a righteous prayer life. Praying in faith is what Jesus did. How can you believe this passage is a promise for good health and an easy life when our Savior prayed and received the good gift of taking the cross for us? We hear him praying for his disciples and the church on the night before he died, and then petitioning God in agony, and finally, Jesus died praying. Jesus died praying. There are many things that we, we can spend a lot of time on this text. There's many things you can take from this text. But what you must understand is that God is sovereign. God loves us. God cares for us. But God wants community with us. God wants to commune with us. He did not take the cross so that we could spend our time with other idols. As all of this is other idols, when we're not with God, what we're living for, our hearts. Our heart is always going to Seek to not serve God. Seek not to love God. Seek to put other things before God. What James is telling the Jews, what he's saying right here, who are dealing with suffering, persecution, famine, injustice, all that, what he's saying is, look, look, I can't promise this is going to be 
well for you. But what I can promise you is that if you commune with God and you walk with the Lord, you will be blessed. No one is in heaven regretting communing with God. That's the best thing that James could have said to the Jews here who are dispersed. And that is why I believe we still have this book. If we were sum this book up, it is to walk in the will of the Lord and pray in faith and believe and trust that he is good. And that is what we have to do as believers here today. It doesn't change. It's still the same. I don't know what you're going through, but I know you're going through something if you're human. God promised us we must go through much tribulations to enter the kingdom. So while you're going through those tribulations, for this suffering, love one lost, a loved one walked out on you, whatever it is, put your trust in God and take that time and that opportunity to commune with him and let him fill your heart with joy. And you can make it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, I'd like to thank you for this book. I thank you for your word. And I thank you what we find out about you in this book as we study it. That you are a powerful God, a majestic God that cannot be shaken by the trials that we find ourselves in. I'm so thankful that you sit outside of time and you know what we're going through, and you decide whether you're going to let us go through that or not. Also telling us that you, that if you let this trial come into our lives, you're going to walk with us through it. You give us the spirit to praise you and to trust you even more. So when we look at salvation, when we look at our life as a Christian, as the song said earlier, you are the author of our salvation. You're in every part of it. Why do we, why do we stop trusting you? Why do the nations rage? Why do we put our trust in so many other things? Why do we keep putting our trust in things that keep failing us? Father, I can't answer those questions. About, well, yes, I can. It's sin. Our hearts. Our hearts are wicked. You tell us all through here. Watch your heart. Examine yourself. And, Father, I just pray that we start listening to that as people. Lord, I just ask that we not look at prayer as a duty. That we understand it is a gift from you. You are asking us. You are saying, come, enter in the fellowship of my son, in the fellowship that I have with my son and the spirit. This is an opportunity for us to be changed, to be known by you, Lord, and the door is wide open. Lord, may we enter it this week. May we, under, may we enter it multiple times this week. May we get to a place where we can truly say we pray without ceasing. And may we reflect your glory in all things that we do and not give false hope to people not promise people that this life is worth living, that this life is all that matters. May we give the gospel in our lives how we live and how we talk, as James has, constructed, has instructed us many times. And what we need to be speaking from our mouths is that there are many people here who are not communing with you, who are unsaved and do not know you. Yet, we all have the same fate. We must stand before you. Or may we May we accept the gift that Jesus provided for us, the, the wall that came down, and we can walk with you in the cool of the day again. May those who do not know you be saved, their hearts be open, that they would, they would not waste their lives trying to find our relationship and other things that don't matter, Lord. Salvation is of you, Lord. And the way of salvation, for any unbeliever here who is seeking deep, deep fellowship, stick around, let's talk. We know the way to salvation. We know the way the Lord has provided. And that way is by faith, not our works. We're going to, you're always going to fail. You're always going to fall. Be redeemed in faith, not in your works. Understand that God loves you and he paid that price for you so you don't have to work anymore. He prayed. He suffered. He drank that cup. Let's call these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.